let's conclude this chapter on induction by talking about the proofs that we've been doing at a little bit higher of a level. It's been said that informal proofs are algorithms and formal proofs are code. So there's an analogy we're drawing here between proof and code. And we're thinking about algorithms in the sense of like maybe pseudocode or as written in an algorithm's textbook. They're not a careful formal syntax in a programming language. Rather, they're a careful informal syntax for communicating with humans. So notice you can still be careful without still being totally formal. Well, in the same way, you can write proofs that communicate with other humans, and you can be careful about those proofs. But you can write informal proofs that are designed to communicate from your brain to someone else's brain. Or you can write what in Software Foundations we call formal proofs because they're being formalized in a syntax inside of Coq. Those proofs are used to communicate with Coq. So keep in mind that you've got a difference of audience. Are you trying to communicate with a human or are you trying to communicate with a machine? There are different techniques, different structures needed for both of those jobs. Let's make that concrete by looking at a couple of proofs here. Here is a formal proof in Coq of the associativity of plus, of the add operator. And it's got a lot of tactics here. Maybe after watching some of these videos, maybe after following along and doing some exercises, you can look at those two lines of proof script and glean something from it. If so, as a friend of mine says, good on you. But I think it must be at least debated, if not admitted, there's not a lot of information there that's really, really helpful to a human. In fact, if you haven't studied Coq at all before, if you just took a computer scientist off the street, as it were, they look at that and maybe the one thing they can figure it out is there's probably a proof by induction going on there, just from the context clues. But the rest of it looks like pretty arcane syntax. It's not communicating a lot of information potentially to this human who doesn't understand Coq. There's a reason for that. It's because this formal proof is trying to communicate with the machine, not with another human. Now, all code that we write, whether it's Coq code or C code or Java code or OCaml code or whatever, all code that we write really does have two audiences as well. Some of it is written for machines. Some of it is written for humans. Actually, all of it's written for the machine and usually all of it's written for humans. Humans have to be able to understand code to maintain it, to make changes in it, uh, to use it as an example and then do something different that's a tweak on it. So it's worthwhile taking time to make your cock formal proof something that communicates not just with the machine, but also with a human. That's why we go to a lot of effort in these proof scripts to add these details that make the proof a little more readable to a human. All right, so after we do induction, we can give names to the things that are inside rather than letting Coq choose those names. Now there's trade-offs either way. Sometimes when you choose names manually, it can make a proof more readable, but also make it a little harder to maintain if the underlying definitions later change. Uh, this is a truth in programming that sometimes it's difficult to know exactly which things to leave to the machine and exactly which things to choose yourself. Uh, but in Software Foundations, we generally will, a lot of the times in these early chapters, choose these names ourselves in order to be a little bit better at communicating with humans. That's the choice we're generally going to make here. Uh, in later volumes in the series, sometimes for sake of automation, we stop doing that. Okay, then we could record if we wanted in comments which of the base case or inductive case we are here. Uh, we're doing that originally here in these early chapters of Software Foundations. Later, in fact, pretty soon, we're going to stop doing that all the time and assume that as you've come to learn to read these proofs, that's one of the things you need less as a human. Uh, you know that you're in two different cases of an inductive proof here, and the exact case you're in is going to matter while you're stepping through that proof, but it doesn't always need to be documented for a human. Still, if you want to document it, go right ahead. And we've used bullets in order to separate out to make it visually clear what's going on and that there's two different cases here. It's also not just for visual, as we've learned before, right? It actually helps structure the proof so that Coq doesn't let you try to go on to the next step if you haven't finished the first one. Okay, so that's a kind of middle ground, uh, something that is designed to communicate to the machine, but also has some additional helpful information in it for a human. On the other hand, 
again, if you pull somebody off the street, a random computer scientist, they may not be able to parse out what's going on here. And that's not their fault. It's an arcane syntax for it. It's, it's readable once you get used to it, but you wouldn't expect someone to understand it right at first. Furthermore, you could critique this and say, well, it's not really communicating to me the essence of the proof that a mathematician would want. Like, why is it true that adding these things together in this way is the same as adding them together in another way? Okay. So for humans, what we generally do is a careful informal proof. We write down a lot of clues, a lot of English or other natural language around it, and we provide a lot of the internal steps like these instantiations uh, for the base case. Now, Koch is, is, is creating those instantiations itself. Implicitly, when we get to this point in the proof, I know that that's exactly what we're going to be looking at for the goal or something like it anyway. But we don't write it out here in the middle of the Koch proof. One of the tricky things then is when learning to program Koch, to prove with Koch, you have to get used to simulating what Koch is going to do inside of its own head, as it were. That's pretty tricky. It takes a lot of work, a lot of exercises to start getting good at that. But down here, we write it out for the human so they can see exactly what's going on. So it's a more verbose proof style. It involves writing down some things that justify proof steps, that spell out for the human reading this what the proof is looking like, in order to communicate an idea from the author of this proof's head to the reader of the proof. Okay, so that's an informal proof in the, in the vocabulary we're using here in Software Foundations. Both informal proofs and formal proofs are important. Both have their places. And if you ever get stuck doing a formal proof in cock, my number one recommendation for you is put cock away, take out a piece of paper, and start doing the informal proof that you would use to explain the situation to another human. That has gotten me and so many of my students unstuck so many times. So don't ever think that just because you're coding in cock, you've given up on informal proof. Not at all. They are still incredibly useful, incredibly powerful, and a, a major part of your tool set.